Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Roy Kessel. I'm the founder of the Sports Philanthropy Network, and we're very excited to have you with us here today. Uh, we're very pleased that we're being joined by Elizabeth Finlayson, who is the nonprofit coach, and she's going to talk about how you can strengthen your fundraising and, and fundamentals of uh, getting more capital for your organization. Um, want to thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of Kayla Bradham, who's our VP of Community Development and the whole Sports Philanthropy Network, that you're able to come and, and be with us today. We encourage you to look at the other webinars that we have coming up as well. In addition, take a look at things that we put out every week, like the Sports Philanthropy Newsstand that comes out on Mondays. We have podcasts that are being released and all of our prior webinars and everything are archived up on our site so you can go and take a look at those. So we appreciate you taking time to join us. And without further ado, I want to turn this over to Elizabeth and give her an opportunity to share all of her, her insight and guidance with us. Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, today we're going to be talking about strengthening your fundraising and we're going to focus on five essentials. There's so many things about fundraising we could spend time on and each area could be an entire webinar itself. We could talk about corporate fundraising or plan giving or any of those things. But today what I wanted to talk about were five things that no matter the size of your organization or what kinds of fundraising you do are really helpful to creating um, effective fundraising. So yeah, with that just a little bit about me, um, as you mentioned, I am uh, the CEO and lead coach of the Nonprofit Coach. My mission personally is to create a fairer, more equitable and inclusive world that is filled with empathy and beauty. And so the way that I get to do that is supporting all of you um, and my nonprofit clients with strategic planning and fundraising training and support through my team. So thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. The other thing I want to mention for everybody is if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to throw those into the chat and then I can raise them for Elizabeth as we go through the presentation. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. That would be great. So um, I just wanted to start, I mentioned about different areas of fundraising. So um, I pulled up this slide here. This is actually based on 2018 giving. Um, we know that giving has changed. Um, 2016 changed giving a lot. Um, last year, giving started to rebound after the election and was starting to follow some more normal trends. And then here we are in 2020 where everything is different. But there's some basic things that are true. We've got these big categories of foundation giving and corporations and individuals. Um, and when we look at those things in this larger perspective, what we can see is the majority of giving is from individuals and um, particularly when you add in bequests. So uh, that is a large amount of the pie. I think for some of us with smaller organizations, we tend to focus on grant writing or we tend to focus on corporations because we know they have a lot of money or um, sometimes just throwing events over and over and again, but really just realizing the biggest pot of money is just people. And, and just having relationships. So yeah, that's just, I think, a really great piece to know um, as you go into your fundraising. So the first essential that I wanted to share was actually about um, mindset. So with this, I really want to put a caveat around this. I am not saying that um, you can believe your way into more giving. Um, I'm I'm just not in that place, but you can believe yourself out of giving. And what I mean by that is, you know, the other day I was speaking to a consultant and we were talking about, he's on the for-profit side, I'm on the nonprofit side, but how much of our time as consultants we spend working with um, people on their mindsets. So I'm just going to start actually by um, giving a little bit of a story. So I have a client I've been working with for three and a half years. And when I met them, they, their organization had been around for 20 years. They had no paid administrative staff. Um, they didn't feel like their board was effective as they wanted it to be. And they didn't really see a lot of hope for changing. They wanted things to be different, but they didn't really see any ways to do that. And where I think mindset comes into this is that what we'll find is that 
limiting thoughts actually limit our actions. So what I found when I was working with this client is there were a lot of limiting beliefs of what kind of organization they were, what they thought they could get. And, you know, looking at this first one, identity. So whenever you hear yourself say something like, I'm not that kind of person, that could be the kind of person that would sit across the table from someone and ask for money, or it could be the kind of person who would look into the data behind something, or the kind of person who will deal with a conflict that's in your organization. Whatever it is, you are at that moment putting a limitation on your behavior. You might have great reasons for that, but I think it's really important to look and actually choose it and not let your brain kind of choose it automatically for you. Um, fear of judgment. So that's the other thing that will often stop us. What is this person going to think? Whenever you're thinking that question, um, it will often stop your action. So again, if you're about to have a conversation with a donor, oh my gosh, they think I'm only about money. They're not going to like me. All that stuff could be going through our heads. Um, it can also be going through that as we're looking at what kind of events to have, whether to stop having an event, anytime we're evaluating, um, that can make a big difference and how we're fundraising. And, you know, one thing that I found over and over again for myself and for other people is what your background is. So for me, I come from a religious background um, that emphasizes suffering and martyrdom. And I find there's a lot of people in the sector who have that. And, um, you know, you, we go in because we want to help people. We want to make a difference. And what I find is when people are really attached to this idea of suffering and martyrdom as a sign of being a good person, if you were to make effective changes or you were to be really assertive in a conversation, that allows you to succeed or you were to like really hit a fundraising goal, it might challenge your identity about who you are as a good person. And so you may find yourself coming close to something and then cutting off your behavior and going back down to that comfortable wallowing. So these are all things that I've seen. So with this particular client, I actually helped them look at their quote unquote lack of selfishness was hurting their organization. So um, they were not able to actually fully fulfill their mission because they didn't want to be the kind of person that was hard on their board, the kind of person that did these kind of asks. Um, and so they were, it really implement, it really came into effect when they were asking. They now having addressed that mindset and taking actions over the next, over the three and a half years, they have a full-time paid executive director. They ask more of their board members, their board members are more engaged. And now they're looking at how do they pay their program staff more so they stop having so much turnover. And all of those things started by addressing mindset. So I'm gonna stop there and just see if there's like any questions. Yeah, I think the challenge for every group is cultivating um, as you said, the mindset and the culture of the organization and being in a position to strengthen that board, because these are, are skill sets that um, if they're not discussed, oftentimes there's not alignment within the board. That is such a great point. And I think often boards and staff have different cultures. So sometimes the board members, they're coming in from their corporate backgrounds, they give a little bit of advice and they come back out again and the staff is still operating from perspective. And I think both, like in any relationship, I think the staff and the board see each other more clearly than either group sees themselves. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's a really great point. And I think anything with mindset, you can't, see it as like the water you swim in, you know, you, it just feels like reality. And so I think that can make it challenges. Like until you know what is there in your mindset, you can't really make a change in it or choose to say like, I like my mindset. This is what I'm keeping. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move to the next one here. So I just did a, a webinar on board of directors. I feel like this comes up over and over again from organizations about like, how do you have an effective board? One thing I say whenever I talk to an organization and they talk to me about how, um, you know, they don't feel like their board is effective, they're not doing enough, all of these kind of things we hear over and over again. A lot of times I just say, I've actually rarely met an organization that feels differently about their board. And I think there's a lot of, 
things structurally built into the model that make that challenge. So for example, our board members are unpaid and they're volunteers and they often don't come from our sector and they haven't run a, no a nonprofit organization, but they're our bosses. And then we spend our time trying to tell them what to do and they turn around and tell us, yeah, do the thing you're doing. Or sometimes they're trying to give advice and it doesn't make sense for what we're trying to do. Or we they're not fundraising and we don't know why. So um, I just wanna kind of address a couple top issues and some things that we can do. This piece of advice I got um, from someone who's a fundraiser here in Chicago, and I think it's such a great one. He just said with your board, use the ones that work, you know, in any board. And he was at a university that was highly effective at fundraising. So you would think their worst board member, the rest of us would be begging to get. And, um, but he just said, yeah, some people they're answering the email and they're doing everything you want them to and some people you're like happy they showed up to the meeting just don't worry about it just get the ones that that do work to keep working so that you get done what you need to get done and I think that makes a big difference it doesn't mean that you stop communicating to the others but don't sweat it really and um, there we'll talk about things to do about non-functioning board members but just really go with what works they're not all going to operate to the same level um, one thing I identified a really long time ago when I first got into fundraising is that there's all different ways to fundraise. That there's fundraising that works for introverts and there's fundraising that works for extroverts. There's fundraising that works for people who are organized and detail oriented and fundraising for people who are just more people person. And so people, people. Um, really just it's the same for our board i think sometimes we push to them over and over again to fundraise or to support our organizations in the way that we think that they should or um, in the most extroverted ways often when reality maybe they're a great researcher or maybe they're going to bring in that one fifteen thousand um, dollar client versus a bunch of five or one thousand dollar people and so really just looking at it from there and not expecting everybody to be exactly the same. I think that's one of the things. And you know, one great way to get your board involved in fundraising is have them do thank you calls. It's such a like a gentle um, way to have them participate. They're not asking for anything. Um, it can be really heartwarming. And so these are all things uh, that you can do that are just easy at any organizational size or level. One of the things that I think comes up when we talk about our board members not fundraising, I think actually comes back to us on the nonprofit side. I've seen it so many times and I've been really on the edge of doing it myself when you want to make a particular quota of numbers of board members, types of board members, oh, our last lawyer left and now we need another one and this one seems great and he's recommended by this other board member, but, you get in the meeting and he says, well, the one thing I won't do is fundraise. Okay, you just need to put the brakes on right there, make it very clear what the expectations are around fundraising and that there are set expectations around fundraising. And if, if that's not appropriate for them, that's great. They can do something else. They can be on a committee. They can be your best friend. They can be a great donor. They shouldn't be on your board. And um, that's often the place I think that we get kind of like, oh, that's okay, and I don't want this other board member to be mad. The other thing, just not having clear documents, have it, have there be a job description, and, and what are the fundraising expectations, and have them sign those things when they're coming on. That will get rid of most of the misunderstandings, I think, that happen with board members. And then finally, really, when you have underperforming board members and you've tried all the tricks and you've done all the things, have you know some straightforward, non-judgmental conversations. We often don't wanna have a straightforward conversation when we're judging people because we're afraid they're gonna hear those nasty thoughts in our head no matter how nice we say it. And the key is to really let all that go, understand they have great reasons why they haven't been coming to meetings or they didn't do what they said they would do. Have a conversation, let them off the hook and then let, let them get off the board if that's what they need to do. Find out what their expectations are. Is it that they, they just need a couple months to get through a promotion that they've had or a new child that's come? Or is it that they realize it's all way more than they thought it would and they were afraid to tell you? You know, so just, really have those conversations and let them go. And it's, it's a benefit for everybody, including them. 
So nothing to be afraid of there. And I didn't put this on here, but one of the things when I was looking over my board materials, getting ready for this, is to just inspire our board members. I think we forget that so often to um, make sure we've got like really interesting program updates in our board meetings. Don't just make it be all business. Um, make sure that you find out why they got on the board. Don't just bring them on because, you know, they are an accountant and you want their accounting skills. If they're really interested in like working with kids and doing sports, make sure there's opportunities for them to do that too. And don't just put them in a silo and then it's a really unfulfilling, you know, experience for them. I think that's a key point. When you look at the engagement of board members, I think one of the biggest challenges for organizations is understanding why people are on the board. So obviously they must support the mission of the organization, but there's usually additional reasons that uh, factor into how engaged they are in terms of their ability to network or interact with other professionals or other business people that might be beneficial for, for their core job or, or their business. Um, and it's interesting to see because I've been on a lot of boards where they don't foster that interaction. And then after a while, people get tired of coming to a meeting to just have the minutes read to them. Yeah, it's such a great point. It's such a great point. And sometimes people are looking to, to um, collect a new skill. So maybe they're, they are good at accounting, but they've never done anything with strategic planning. So, you know, if you know that you can get them on the strategic planning committee or things like that. So um, just knowing what is there for them. I, I was on a theater board and one of the board members, he just really had an unrequited love for theater and he wanted to do something with that. So, um, you know, just making sure there's some kind of opportunity like that. So it's just not all work. All right, let's look at relationships and communication. You know, this is more important right now than it really feels like it has ever been. <laughs> um, I keep using this quote all the time from Kimberly O'Donnell from Network for Good. Um, she had said it in a call that I was in, um, but she said, uh, there's not a lot we can control right now except our donor relationships. And I think this is absolutely true um, that many of us have been sitting in our home offices um, wondering what we're gonna do, our events are canceled or our programs are canceled, but um, we can be calling up our donors. We can be asking how they're doing. We can be uh, finding out what their interests are. We can be having Zoom calls. We can be having, you know, for some of us, we're saving on transportation time. We're saving on lunch meetings. Um, can we be doing some Zoom meetings with people? Can we send video acknowledgments? What are the things that we could be doing right now um, to keep relationships going? Um, Sometimes I feel like in my field, people feel weird about reaching out to people they don't know that well. And one of the ways I suggest getting over it is to just really get in touch with that place inside of yourselves that actually cares how other people are doing. And when we're not just focused on the work and what do we have to get done and the tasks, but if you're just really in that place, then picking up the phone and finding out how some donor that you don't know is, uh, it's really helpful and you know, take notes on that, put it in your database. Um, later you wanna remember that you know, it's their son that's in college, they're not the one who just lost their mother. You don't wanna get that stuff mixed up, but just really find out how they're doing and it, it will help your fundraising, but it, it'll help all of you have a great day. And to know that a lot of times our donors have been upset because they've been treated like an ATM that Donor retention is down to about 40% on average across all nonprofits. That means that we're losing more donors every year than we bring in. One of the reasons this happens and we don't notice is because we're often bringing in new donors, but all this focus on acquisition really, I think, prevents us from seeing what's there in our relationships. And the other thing going into this time of the pandemic is that trust was already down in government, in for-profit, and in the nonprofit sector. So it was like across all sectors. So one of the antidotes to a lack of trust is to just an increase in communication. So use the personal stories you have. Um, use the facts you have to bolster your case. Um, looking at your ask, make them about 25% of your communication. Some 
organizations are all ask. There's just no real communication there. They drop off um, between asks. And some organizations are on social media all the time and they're constantly posting and there's no solicitations going on. Neither one of those really work. You really want to have a balance. And these things are going to be more important than ever as we've been riding a fundraising surge. We're probably going into a dip right now. We don't know how long that's going to be. Communication is more important than ever right now. I think that's a great point. When you when you look at it, um, donors still want to be cared about and not necessarily looked at just as a checkbook. And so reaching out, we've had a lot of organizations tell us that it's really a four-step process. Number one, reaching out and asking the donor how they're doing. Number two, thanking them for past support. Right. Number three, updating them on what their activities are and how they're responding to the crisis. And then last, not even an ask, but really just advising them of what the needs are for the organization financially going forward. And we've seen a lot of organizations um, get a number of donations doing that um, without having a formal ask. Yeah, 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 those are great points. And the other thing to know is that millennials as a generation and then major donors in general, this trend has been going for a long time of donors being interested in impact um, more so than in previous generations. The previous generations um, might have split their donations across a lot of organizations. They may not have been emphasizing how um, effective an organization was. Impact is just more important than ever, and we've got a lot of channels to communicate that. Additionally, we know that um, donors who are communicated through multiple channels actually give more often at higher dollar amounts and for longer periods of time. So just become far more valuable. And then finally, in this day and age, be interesting. You know, I think that's, that's something that, you know, can't be, uh, can't be said too infrequently. So let's talk about tracking data and analytics. This is just like one of my favorite topics. So fundraising is really both an art and a science. It takes creativity and ingenuity, but people are also frequently guessing. So they think they know, and I'll have people just come on calls with me all the time and they'll be like, oh, well, I just know that this is boring or people don't like this or they don't read that when all the case studies say something different than that. And it happens really frequently. And that's why like, you can't really use your gut just to make these decisions. What you can do is use your gut to design a test and say, I'm gonna try two opposite things and then see which one really works with my donors. Um, but, you know, otherwise, we're not really doing as great a job as we can. And one of the ways that I did this is I worked in an organization that didn't really have a direct mail program when I came in. And over the course of four years, every year um, at the year end, I did at least one test. And when doing that testing, I was able to find out what of the best practices really worked with this group, what didn't. Um, and each year, our appeals and campaign really got better and better and better. And so that over time, like we grew to having a much larger dollar amount because we were putting in all of the best practices during that time period. And um, it was really great. The last campaign when I was there was just like smooth, everything worked. We knew what worked, we knew why it worked. Um, and that's just really helpful. So one is really just test whenever possible. If you have a really small list, it's hard to get a statistically significant result. So what you need to do is test things that are important to know um, and things that are really different from each other. And then you have to, as much as possible, keep all other variables the same. And um, But it's just a really great way of getting information about what works for your organization. This is also in this time when many of us are in home offices, it's a great time to, to invest in and work on your database. So every database I've ever seen or ever worked in um, has crummy data in it, has things that are wrong. People move, they don't tell you, your records get out of date. 
I typically, um, most of the places I've worked over the summer is a great uh, dip in activity. That's when I'm usually doing lots of my database updates. I'm um, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with my donors. I'm getting information in there. And so everything's set up for the next busy fundraising time. I think this can be that as well. It's a great time if you're making those donor calls, get that data into your database, get everything recorded and tracked. So that you're always learning and you're always knowing more about your people. So as you talk about the donor databases, um, give people a sense. I know there's a lot of different options out there. We could probably rattle off a, a dozen <laughs> pretty quickly, but what, what are some of the ones that you like working with? That's a really great question. So um, there's everything from, you know, the free software that's really more designed for businesses to like the most complex, very expensive systems. I find that, you know, a lot of times it depends on your own organizations. So um, a couple caveats. One I would say is I'm not a big fan of the free business software getting kind of shoehorned into nonprofit needs. I find it's not as effective as it should be when there's pretty good options out there that are not that expensive. Um, I love the really big, expensive um, Razor's Edge Blackbot and I, you know, even some of the last ones, the Donor Perfect and those kind of things. But um, some of those have gotten a little clunky over time and many organizations don't need highly complex solutions or very expensive things. I, um, I currently, I have a working relationship with Network for Good. So that is my caveat there, but I will say it is a, it's a simple, straightforward system for small to mid-sized organizations that has some high functionality for um, paired with simplicity. I think you don't always see that pair together. I like those things. There's Neon in Chicago um, is pretty good too. So um, there's there's some good systems up there. You know, for my business, I use HubSpot, which is free and online, at least for the amount that I use it. So right. there's, there's different Thanks. things out there. No problem. So uh, I think when we talk about tracking and data and metrics, I mean, again, you could spend at least an hour just on this, but there's a few things I think that are really important. Um, tracking your donor retention, I think is critical. Um, if you don't know you're losing most of your donors, it's hard to know what to do about it. Um, knowing how long it takes to the, from your first gift to your second gift so you can get in there and, um, start doing things that work and testing those things. Okay, I did it for this group. I didn't do it for this group. Did it work? Did I get a second gift? Did I get it sooner? How does it work? Um, asking your donors, finding out from them what is working. So if you're making those donor calls, ask them about your newsletter, ask them about your programs, ask them what they like. Um, tracking your average gift. This is important. So sometimes um, we're going to be when you're making your fundraising asks, you want to have a specific dollar amount. If you, you could just pick something randomly out of your head, but it's better when you have a sense of what the average gift is. It's even better when you can segment your asks, but we're not gonna deal with any of that in this conversation. But basically, um, having that information at hand is important. And a lot of your databases can tell you this pretty quickly. And ultimately also the track, the, uh, the cost to acquire a donor. So because so many of us, our fundraising systems are set up to get more and more donors, do the event, do the event, um, do this, send the email, be on social media, we're constantly in these acquisitional efforts. We don't know what it takes to get a donor. We don't know what it takes to keep a donor. Um, so I think for a small organization, I would say you don't have to put staff time in there. You can if for a most effective answer, but even just getting um, what did it cost? What were the mailing costs or what were, um, you know, the event costs? What did it take to get this person in and what did it take to keep them? That's really important and you can work on, do I need to bring that cost down? Do I need to just focus on retention? What are the activities I need to do based on that information? So let's move on to asks. This is something I think I feel when people talk about fundraising or they want to go into fundraising training, I feel like this is really what they're talking about. I think people are so scared of this 
because for a lot of people, it's that moment of truth that you're going to sit across the table and look them in the eye and ask them to part with their hard-earned money. And I think this is the part that makes people kind of sweat a little bit. And um, I would be lying if I said that I never got nervous when I sat down with a donor, but um, I used to be an actor. So I'll just say um, there's a certain amount of nervousness that I think is actually good that uh, is helpful for performance. I think those of you who are athletes who are on here, I think probably know that as well. But um, asks are essential. I think as I talked about, you don't wanna have a program that has no asks in it. Otherwise you're just spending a lot of time talking to people. That's very nice of you, but um, it's not very effective for funding your organization. And um, you don't wanna do all asks. That's where donors start to feel underappreciated because we have all these different channels for communication, um, there should be, by the time you're sending out an ask, people should feel like they've heard from you in a lot of different ways and they've gotten a lot of your messages. So um, one of the ways that um, I've heard this put forward that I think is always really helpful is to looking at an ask like a marriage proposal. If you're constantly going on dates with somebody and you never ask them, that starts to feel a little bit weird. And that person may be wondering why you keep going out to coffee for them and updating them on your organization. And they may start to wonder if you actually are considering marriage. So it's really important that you do eventually get to the ask um, that's there. And I think similar to a marriage proposal, you should probably know what they're going to say when you ask them. At this point, you know um, what they're interested in, what programs of yours are the most important, how they came to know you, um, what values are similar between them and the organization. So if you know those things, I think that it, it actually makes the ask a lot easier. And just remember, an ask is an invitation. They can just say no. And a no is a not yet. It's just like a not right now. And to just stay in relationship with them, keep communicating with them. Eventually it might be a yes. Don't just, uh, you know, be like, ugh, done with you. So um, there are great times to ask. That's the other thing. Um, we've, we've been in a great time to ask because we have been in a giving surge. We know that donors are likely starting to put the brakes on. We should not put the brakes on for them. That is not helpful for you or for them. Um, other great times to ask um, when they're coming up to a year since they gave is, an, is a great time to ask uh, during the year end that um, the reason you see so many solicitations from nonprofits is because that's when the donors are giving. So it's really, really important. Um, the biggest giving month of the year is December. The biggest giving day of the year is December 31st. So those are great times to ask. And um, yeah, there are other great times, but really just looking at those as um, some of the big things there. Be brave, be brave. Don't be afraid to fail, it's okay. You know, sometimes people will not like you. Sometimes people will say no. Sometimes it will be about you and sometimes it won't. And um, if there's anything you need to clean up, if there's anything you need to say to somebody or apologize for or anything your organization has done, like, you know, sending mail to their dead husband for four years, just acknowledge what there is to acknowledge, solve what there is to solve and um, move on from there. You know, you're not, um, there are some things that I don't like when I've heard fundraisers or nonprofit people say like, oh, I'm pestering them. I don't like begging, you know, I don't look at fundraising that way. To me, um, fundraising is matchmaking. You're really finding people who have um, a desire to make a positive difference in the world and you're matching them with the organization in the world that fulfills what they are trying to achieve. So you are just the vehicle for what they are trying to do. Um, I'm not mad at the people who make shoes for getting me great shoes. I'm happy to part for my money to end up with a great pair of shoes. I'm happy to part with my money to end up with a great world. You know, so um, that's all it is. People are, they're shopping for a better world and you're what they're spending their money on. So, um, and if you're not it for them, maybe they think something else. So, and that's okay too. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, which is ultimately what you're saying is you really have to listen to the donor because they're going to tell you what, what they're interested in and what they're passionate about. And as you have that, if you go into the, the communication with the concept that it's a conversation versus a ask or a, a hard sell, you know that what you're doing is I'm finding out why Elizabeth has a passion for helping the world and what our organization does that fits 
that type of interest level. And she can tell me what she's interested in. If I've done my job, I have you articulate that first before I even do the ask so that I know how to frame that ask in terms of what are we doing that excites you. And when you go in with your donors, the more information you have about them and the more background you have about what excites them, then you've got the ability to know that you've already listened to them. And so now you're giving them something they want, you know, no different than a menu, right? If, if I walk in and and I know that you love pizza, I can, you know, I can put the whole list of pizzas in front of you and and you're going to find something you like. Absolutely. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, And, you know, a couple things I really want to emphasize around this interesting time that we're in. Um, Donor advised funds are really helpful during emergencies because they're a pot of money that people have put aside. Um, I'm really recommending people go through their their nonprofit list, look at the checks from their donors and see like, hey, do I have anybody here who gave from a donor advised fund? Let's make sure they're one of the people that I'm reaching out to and checking how they're doing and having conversations. Um, You know, other things like stock gifts are cheaper for donors to give than cash. So if you're talking to a donor about a higher level gift, let's say $10,000, Um, maybe they can do it in stock. Then they can save taxes on both um, the income tax as well as the capital gains. You know, you don't personally have to know or understand a lot of complex details around that to understand that it's just cheaper for them, you know, and just talk to them about it. They may not have thought about doing it as a stock gift. They could even increase their gift because of it. Or, you know, they might just say, great, now I can save money doing it that way. Um, Lots of smaller organizations can't hold on to stocks. So um, you might want to have a mechanism that just, or a policy that just says, okay, we're just selling these right off the bat. But um, that's, uh, you know, it's just a great way uh, for people to give right now. Um, We looked back, uh, there's a coach at Network for Good who sent out some information about uh, the Great Depression. And we really found that planned giving went up during the Great Depression. It's a really great way for someone to make a gift and um, it doesn't cost them anything, you know, or at least a typical bequest doesn't. So that's something, um, you know, just to be looking about those things right now. Um, these are all ways. And monthly giving. Monthly giving is so easy, right? If somebody normally would give $100, And instead, they give $10 a month because that's easy for them and they could stop it whenever they want if they're worried about the economy and it's actually additional income for you. So um, there's all different ways that people can be giving right now. And I think just having those conversations, like you said, Roy, just really being sensitive to where people are at. And yeah, that's it. Like be sensitive to where people are at. You know, I'm not saying cram ass down people's throat if they're like, I can't, I just lost my job. Just say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, I didn't know that. And just have a conversation about how they're doing, you know. So sometimes I think we forget when we're being fundraisers is just like, just be human. And I think that will solve a lot of problems. (laughs) Oh, and I just, this last point, your organization is important. I have had so many people over the last couple months say things like, does anybody care about, you know, my orphans in Haiti? Because, you know, right now people are in a, you know, a pandemic, it's like, yes, yes, they do. Do they care about my sports program? Yes, they do. They cared about it before. They still care about it. They may also care about global health in a way that they never have. Um, But, you know, it's up to them to choose what they will and will not do. But it's also up to us to communicate our mission and our impact and how the pandemic is affecting our mission and our impact. If we're not able to get together for programs or for doing it over Zoom, or if um, the parents of our kids are losing their jobs and we've had to pivot and do other things for people, we need to be communicating that. Um, That all should be in those asks. Yeah, so I'm going to stop and just see, you know, are there any other questions that you see, you know, Roy, as you're talking to organizations? Yeah, I think that there's a a lot of common questions and and the discomfort about asking for gifts is something that I I think is almost universal. Every organization struggles with that unless somebody is a a seasoned development person um, that is very comfortable in that role. Virtually all board members um, 
that I've been around and for any organization express discomfort at having to go out and do the solicitations. I think, um, you know, I know for me personally, I much prefer to do a face-to-face -face solicitation than a phone solicitation because I feel like I'm having a conversation with Elizabeth and I'm getting to know her as opposed to just dialing for dollars and having, in a sense, a scripted and personal uh, request. But I think one of the things that, that you mentioned earlier, which is important to highlight, is there's a lot of ways to contribute to the fundraising process that board members can do. And sometimes one of the easiest that I've seen is the, the organizations that have board members really just call and thank existing donors, not asking them for a gift, because that opens them up to communicating and, and listening and hearing what these people have to say and not feeling the pressure of, uh-oh, I, I didn't close. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the, the tips that I would give. The, the second one, which somebody expressed in an organization I was part of, and I, I thought it was very important, which is every ask gets you closer to a gift. So even if at the end of the day, the hit rate in theory is, is low, right, and you need to ask a thousand people to get a hundred gifts for an organization, if you, Elizabeth, call 50 people, even if you got zero gifts out of your 50, that's helping us get through the list and get access to all of the people who may be potential donors. And so you might have just got a list of 50 that weren't in the spot to give, and maybe Roy's list of 50 got 20 to give. That doesn't mean that there's that amount of discrepancy between your ability and my ability. And I think we're trained on this success level and sales level that closing a gift is, is the only thing that's important. When I think if you go back to a metric of looking at how many contacts did you make and how many conversations did you have? Because if you go back to that person and instead of hanging up when you hear they're not in a position to give right now, but you take the time to ask about them and ask about their family and have that communication, I think that's going to come back to you in a bountiful way in, in the future because when they might get their job back or feel a little more comfortable with what's going on. Um, these are people that are going to remember your organization called and reached out to me and spoke to me and took the time to talk to me um, even when you knew I wasn't a potential donor at that point. Absolutely. I think that um, makes a lot of sense. It actually reminds me, I took guitar lessons with the Old Town School of Folk Music. Those of you in Chicago probably uh, know that one. And uh, the teacher had said something great is that um, you had to use up all your mistakes, that there was a limited number of mistakes, but you had to use them up as fast as possible. So you just needed to keep playing to get through them all. And it was such a great I think mindset because for me, I think it's starting to play. I make a mistake. I'm like, oh, I'm not good at this yet, and I want to stop. And I think it's the same with like you're saying, like making calls or making asks. It's like you just haven't used up enough calls yet to get to that person who wants to say yes. And I think when the calls are real conversations, then you don't need to feel bad about them in any way. You know, particularly if you're finding out, wow, I've had three people on this, you know, in these calls now tell me that they loved the last event or they don't like the newsletter or or, you know, we're, we're really um, having some data issues and how we're addressing our mail or whatever those things are. It's all feedback. It's all learning that allows you to be the best you can be. And, you know, actually, there's another thing that's in there. So frequently, um, I have heard people say over the time of my career, and maybe once or twice, I was one of them. I was like, oh, this would just be so much easier if you just had one person just write a check for everything. But I think fundraising isn't just about making money, even though it is about making money. It is in so many ways about making our organizations accountable to the broader community. And we can have a whole, you know, a whole world of conversations around, um, you know, equity and inclusion and who gets to be part of those conversations. Um, but the truth is it's foundations that have often pushed our nonprofits to be inclusive, to be diverse, to measure our impact. It's mm -hmm. donors who've told us that things didn't work or um, that we need to be better. Even, you know, 
who's had a sharp tongued board member who used to call you up after everything that they didn't like. I mean, those people are the people who make you better. And if we weren't fundraising and if we weren't interested in their dollars, maybe we wouldn't take the time to find those things out. And so I think um, fundraising is sometimes a humbling process. And I think it's, it's good for us and our organizations and our effectiveness. There, there's no doubt about that. And I think where you raise that point of having one person write the check, I think we're seeing with today's COVID crisis, the challenges of that, that if you put all your eggs in one basket um, or even in one sector or anything else, that you, you're going to have difficulties because people hit financial straits at different times and in different ways. And it, it could be a business downturn. It could be a divorce. It could be any number of other factors. And so uh, I think it's dangerous for organizations to get too comfortable looking at things and saying, I'm only going to rely on the, the big gifts, or I'm only going to rely on uh, the corporate support. And, and these little gifts don't matter because they, they do matter. They add up and that base of support ends up being your network into other resources and other contacts that become board members and future donors as well. And so having that breadth of contacts is, is important, um, as well as the fact, I mean, just in reality, right, it's a training ground for new volunteers or new board members to be making the asks for the smaller gifts um, and not going directly to a point where they're asking for a major gift because they don't know how to necessarily have those conversations until they've been seasoned a bit more and, and had some of that experience. So uh, Elizabeth, you've given us some great insight today. We really appreciate your time. Um, here's Elizabeth's contact information. We'll make sure that the slides are up with the video as well and you can go through and, and contact her. She's got a, a wealth of resources and experience in this space. Um, we hope you'll check out some of our other webinars, our podcasts, and all the inf other information on our site. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, and we hope that you'll join us on some of our future webinars. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with your group. Uh, this is Roy Kessel signing off on behalf of the Sports Philanthropy Network. Thank you. <laughs>